Hello, I'm Andy Fraser. Today I'll talk about hidden Markov models in dynamical systems. To help follow the presentation, you can fetch these slides from my website, fraserphysics.com. There's a link here in the footnote. Hidden Markov models are among the simplest stochastic processes. And while I won't be presenting any new results, I hope to persuade you that studying this simple case gives insight into powerful basic ideas. Here I'll use the Lorentz system to illustrate data assimilation, a key basic idea. I start with 20,000 points to represent my prior, the stationary distribution of the system. The upper row represents state space and the lower row represents a sequence of observations considered one at a time. I suppose that the observations have a finite width. Here's the first observation in the time series, and this is where it is in the prior. It constrains the distribution in state space to look like this. Next, I take the constrained distribution and map it forward one time step using the Lorentz dynamics. Now I examine the next observation. That further constrains the distribution of states, and I map that distribution forward, and then I iterate. The procedure provides a conditional distribution in state space at any time t given all of the previous observations. That's really all there is to data assimilation. Now, independence assumptions make up the essential structure of models that are used for data assimilation. They're illustrated by this Bayes net drawing. The key idea is that given the state at a particular time, earlier and later values, are conditionally independent of each other. Combining a prior with a distribution of the first state, the state transition probability function, and an observation probability function completes the specification of the model. These calculations implement data assimilation, like what I just showed for the Lorentz. You start with a state prior, you use the observation distribution, and then this interval gives the forecast distribution. The notation here is a little weak. I need both functions and the values of those functions for specific arguments. Uh, sorry that my notation doesn't support that distinction. Now I examine the first observation value, and combining these functions, I get the updated conditional distribution. Next, I integrate that conditional distribution with the state transition probability to get the state forecast distribution. Using that state forecast distribution as the prior for the next step, I'm ready to iterate. In the 60s, this was all worked out for two special cases. If everything is Gaussian and linear, you have to integrate Gaussians, and it's called column filtering. If everything is discrete, the integrals are simple sums, and it's called a hidden Markov model. These two graphs illustrate the difference between a Markov model and a hidden Markov model. For the Markov model, the observations uniquely define the states, <laughs> so you can get a sequence like this. For the hidden Markov model, the observations are random functions that depend on the states. A sequence of observations may or may not correspond to a unique sequence of states, and so you can get a sequence of observations that look like this. While these models are old and simple, like the hydrogen atom and the harmonic oscillator in physics, they were powerful foundations for representing more difficult problems. Here's a toy example that I worked out years ago. I integrated the Lorentz system for a long time and discretized the x component in time and value. Here's a plot of a short piece of the x time series. And here's a plot of the corresponding discrete observations. Then I used the baum welch algorithm, I'll describe that in a few minutes, to train a hidden Markov model. By train, I mean get a maximum likelihood estimate of these model parameters. I chose to use 12 states in the hidden Markov model to make a nice picture. If I'd used more states, the forecasts would have been a little bit more accurate. I trained the model on the first half of the data, 
Next, I used the fitted model to estimate the state sequence that corresponds to observations from the second half of the data. I used the Viterbi algorithm, which I'll describe in a few minutes, to calculate that estimate. The estimate is sometimes called the decoded state sequence. Here's a plot of part of the decoded state sequence. Finally, I get this picture using the decoded state sequence to assign colors to dots in the original state space. Looking at this picture, sometimes people say, this just looks like a second order Markov model. Isn't a hidden Markov model just a higher order Markov model? Well, this is not a second order Markov model. <laughs> and the model described by this graph shows that you can have a hidden Markov model that is not a simple Markov model of any order. Here, if you get a C followed by a string of A's, you know that the next non-A observation will be a B no matter how long you have to wait. No matter how long a block size you use, the past is not, in general, independent of the future, given a block of observations. Now I want to talk about algorithms. I've noticed that in a lot of presentations, when someone talks about my algorithm, I would rather hear about what they want to calculate than the clever way that they do it. So here I'll focus more on what these algorithms accomplish than how they do it. Here I've written out the data assimilation procedure for hidden Markov models. <laughs> I've already discussed the basic ideas twice. All that's different now is that these discrete sums have replaced integrals. The algorithm is usually called the forward algorithm, and the updated state estimate here is, uh, at each time is called alpha. That's the distribution of state probabilities given previous observations. If you have an archive time series, rather than calculating how the state at time t depends on previous observations, you can calculate how the state at time t depends on subsequent observations. The procedure that does that is called the backward algorithm. The calculations are similar to those in the forward algorithm. The backwards forecast is called beta. And uh, the normalization looks pretty funny. But it's chosen, that normalization is chosen, so that you can calculate the conditional probability of being in a particular stage at a particular time, given all of the data, by multiplying alpha and beta. <laughs> For a linear Gaussian system, that combination of a forward term and a backward term is called Kalman smoothing. To be correct, you need to combine a forward updated term with a backward forecast term. It's easy to get lost in the Gaussian integrals, uh, but using intuition from the simpler hidden Markov model case can help. The baum welch algorithm incorporates the forward algorithm and the backward algorithm to get a maximum likelihood estimate of the model parameters given a sample of observed data. Sometimes it's called the forward-backward algorithm. As a special case of the EM algorithm, it was developed at the Institute for Defense Analysis Communication Research Division in Princeton, New Jersey, before Dempster and company published their paper on EM. The algorithm alternates between calculating the conditional distribution of the unobserved states and using that conditional distribution to re-estimate the model parameters. The key calculation gives the conditional probability of each state transition at each time step given the observed data. So that's here. Uh, I don't think I'll say anything more about it. Uh, the last algorithm to talk about is the Viterbi algorithm. It calculates the maximum likelihood sequence of states given a sequence of observations. The procedure is kind of like the forward algorithm, but some of the sums are replaced by taking a maximum. It's interesting that the sequence of maximum likelihood states is not, in general, the maximum likelihood sequence of states. In fact, the sequence of maximum likelihood states may be an impossible sequence. The last thing I want to talk about is entropy. There are two equivalent notions of entropy, namely, 
the exponential rate at which the number of plausible sequences grows, that's this, and the exponential rate at which the probability of each plausible sequence decays, that's this. For a chaotic process, you can estimate the true entropy from the off and off exponent estimates. That's this sum here. Then you can characterize the performance of a new model, theta, not the one that generated the data, by looking at the logarithmic average of the probability per time step of a long time series calculated using that model. And that's this calculation. Here, phi is the true process and theta is the model. The difference between these two quantities is the relative entropy rate, or the kuhlbach liebler divergence. It's never negative, and it's zero when the model matches the true process. So this plot is for quantized Lorentz data. I fit a sequence of hidden Markov models to a training data set and evaluated each of those models on a different test set. I tried more and more hidden states, and I didn't get a match before I ran out of memory on my computer. The training data set was larger than the one I used for the previous illustrations. It had to be very large to uh, get uh, the states, uh, the millions of states visited uh, several times. It's interesting that even with millions of parameters, the models don't make ideal predictions. Uh, so uh, the conclusion is, uh, even though hidden Markov models are uh, simple known technology, learning about them can help you think about other ideas. Uh, I've touched on some of these ideas in this list. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks to the organizers. And remember, the slides are on my website uh, down here in the footnote, fraserphysics.com.